Aloha, everyone. Welcome back to the Body and Soul Wisdom Podcast. It is a truly exciting and also deep honor to welcome this week's guest to my podcast, Heather Ash Amara, coming to us today from Phoenix, Arizona, as she is on book tour for her new book, Wild, Willing, and Wise. And I'm just so honored that you're willing to take time out of your day on your book tour to connect with us, to share some secrets and seeds of wisdom that you've really embodied your entire life. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're so welcome, Jen. I'm so delighted to get to be here with everyone and with I'm, you. I'm really excited too. I Most of my audience are, are women and... Um, so some of them may be very familiar with your with your work, particularly the book that really changed my life, which is Warrior Goddess. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about that, and maybe some people in the audience, your work is new. So I'm really excited to to just share everything that you've been doing for really three decades, your or more, really since your whole life. Your story begins when you were seven years old. As I was reading your bio, thinking about writing that first book, I just thought, wow, the wisdom has really been there since a really young age. You've written nine books. You host retreats. You are on book tour right now. You've had many amazing, influential people in your life. And we could spend an entire podcast probably just talking about your life story and all the wisdom that you gathered. But today for this time, I'm really excited to tap into the wisdom of unconditional leadership and where that might take us through uh, feminine archetypes, which is something that uh, I tap into in retreats and the work that I do with women. And it's something that's going to speak to our audience. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm wondering for the people who are new or even the people that know you, can you just share with us a little bit about how your name came to be Heather Ash and what that means to you? Yes, absolutely. So I was born Heather. I was born in Hong Kong. And when I was, gosh, in my early 20s, my one of my first teachers, Vicki Noble, said, everyone, you should go to a fire walk with my friend Peggy. And I was like, fire? I like fire. That sounds like fun. Had no idea what she was talking about. And I showed up at this fire walk, and there was about 40 women. And it just changed my life in such a drastic way. And I dedicated myself to the fire and became a fire walking instructor in 1990 and have been training fire walking instructors and walking on fire and dancing on fire ever since. And so Ash was a nickname that my friends gave me and I decided to bring it together at one point. And so my people that are close to me know call me Ash or Heather Ash. And it, it's a, uh, I love that word because it's also about transformation, like the transformation that happens when we phoenix and use that ash to create new things. And also I have a deep love for trees. So I also love being connected mm. to the ash tree, which is the world tree. Ooh, I really love the balance of what you just shared because the tree is like really grounding and strong and rooted and the fire is really transformational and like, you know, it's where the alchemy happens and how ironic that you're actually in the city of Phoenix at this moment <laughs> as we're speaking. That's just kind of a fun <laughs> thing, right? That um, is. So I want to share with my audience, you know, I, um, my audience is familiar with me just to share a little bit for you to just sort of understand where I'm coming from that for the framework of this conversation. My previous life in this life, I attended a military academy. I was a mechanical engineer, very um, washed into a masculine society and had a near-death experience with the birth of my first daughter 18 and a half years ago, which really altered the course of my life. And from that moment on, be shifted from being an engineer to stepping into very feminine practices, became a holistic practitioner, started to learn energy work, um, became a health coach and then a life coach. And then in 2016, it was actually a very challenging year. I love how the synchronicities happen. I was approached by a friend who was creating a women's circle around your work in warrior goddess training and or with the warrior goddess book. So we did a full, I think three month 
series where we would read a chapter together every week. We would come together and we would talk about it. And we were all going through really challenging things in our life. And this book really gave me the permission that I needed to understand that I had been living somebody else's life and I wasn't living the truth of who I was, which was probably, well, I know and believe in this moment that that the truly like near death out of body experience that I had, ironically, when becoming a mother to a daughter um, was what I needed to shift into the truth of who I was. I was really energetically completely living out of alignment with my soul frequency. And so this book really gave me the permission that I needed to connect with the parts of my divine feminine, that I could still be strong in this warrior mentality that I had had. I was just living it in a masculine way. And it gave me the permission to see the strength in the divine feminine in what felt true to me as a woman, the wisdom, the nurturing, the maiden, you know, all the archetypes that we can talk about. And you beautifully, if anybody hasn't read this book, first read this one before we even get to talk about, you know, the one that you just published on July 30th this year. Um, but I know I have so many people in my life who could still benefit from one of your greatest works, in my opinion, which was that book. It just really gave me the permission to completely shift everything and tap into my intuition, my creativity, the um, the goddess, the nurturing, the feminine within me that I had no idea even existed. And I'm the mother of two daughters. So while we are here, I want to say I am so grateful for your work and for that opportunity. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful that I get to thank you in this moment because it was truly transformational. From that moment, I I began, I gave myself permission to go to retreats where I learned about the divine feminine and, and archetypes. And then I became a retreat facilitator in that work and have led work. I shifted from health coaching into women's work. And your book was the gateway into that work. So um, just an example of how your work creates a truly massive ripple effect in and so I just want to thank you for that. And to anyone who's listening, start with that one. If you if you haven't already, I can't wait to tap into your wild, willing, and wise. I've got a a really long plane flight coming up to Tahiti pretty soon, so I'm ordering that book to read on the flight. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, so I want to talk, you know, as, as I've been doing this work for 15 years, I'm in a space where I'm a mentor for other coaches and wellness leaders, specifically when they want to lead retreats. So it's really helping women to tap into, uh, leaning into more of that wise woman archetype, kind of the space and age that we're at. I myself am 47, but just kind of more, not really the age, but the time in our life where we're, you know, we've, maybe we've been through some of the archetypes, we've had life experiences. We're in a space where we're, really wanted to embody and own our gifts, we probably spend a little bit less time. We've probably been through some hardships and some challenges. We've learned a little bit, but we notice that we're still, we still get to meet those challenges, whether we have, um, you know, the people pleaser or um, the overgiving. When I, when we look at feminine archetypes, there's also a shadow to them, right? And some of those feminine shadows are where we, we can overgive or, um, you know, every archetype has its shadow. I'm really excited to talk about taking your decades and decades of experience and all the wisdom that you've gathered, because I, there's so much there, to really create the space to support women in this space of their life and how they can tap into their wisdom as leaders and really understand the shadows that might come up, um, such as people pleasing or controlling, isolating the the busyness, which is like one of our greatest distractions in, in the world today. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, let, let's just look at them at a moment for like a leadership perspective and, and archetypes. Do you have archetype leadership archetypes that you work with? I have uh, what I call unconditional leadership that 
is not necessarily an archetype, but it's a, a way of being. Because sometimes I think that when we think about leadership, we think of a doing. Yeah. And I'm really training people in, to deepen into the beingness that we're emanating. And that, you know, I can liken it to the, the new book, Wild, Willing, and Wise. Like, I also love working with energy. And Warrior Goddess is such, I'll just jump back to that first one. And thank you for your share. <laughs> You know, as an author, we don't know always what the impact is. And so it's always such a joy to hear that there's this seed that has gone out and created a whole, you know, forest that we didn't even know about. So gratitude for that. So with Warrior Goddess, there was this, this energetic of the warrior, of the clarity, focus, commitment, that 100% yes energy. And the goddess, which is the opening and the play and the creativity and how will we get there and how will we bring a lot of people with us and that it's not that we're trying to get 50% warrior and 50% goddess and then be like okay now I'm balanced it's that some of us present more as warrior and that's our nature and some of us you know like in your experience take on what I call a shell of warrior mm. that is not actually our nature but we think this is what I'm supposed to be and we can also do the opposite. I know plenty of people that took on the goddess shell when they really are much more warrior. So we're finding what's actually our expression and what's, what are the shells on top of that. So that was where I started with warrior goddess and those two archetypes, and which are incredibly helpful in leadership. And then the expansion into the new book of wild, willing, and wise is based on these old archetypes of maiden mother crone and I wanted to get to the core and I feel like that's really what my work with leadership is to help people get to the depth of what they're bringing forward and what their actual work is and and I got there by making a lot of mistakes over the <laughs> times that I've been you know working with people and that there's an we can be an excess of a energy so we can have excess wild and we can have a deficiency of wild we can have excess willing which is the codependency and that i'll take care of everybody else and we can have a deficiency of willing which is i'm procrastinating i'm holding myself back and then same with wise we can have an excess of wise and a deficiency of wise and we're we're looking for what's our balance mm. so in relationship to leadership if we if we lean into the willing just for this conversation that willing archetype of of our willingness to show up and do hard things and have courage that in a conditional leadership model which is what we see all around us and how we're often in relationship to ourselves conditional says i will love you if i will accept you if you're okay if you present in a particular way and especially with women, we often create this image of perfection of who we're supposed to be. And what I often see in leadership and in all our lives, where we then create an image of, oh, as a leader, I'm supposed to look like this. And we don't have a lot of feminine divine models around leadership. And we're, and we're creating it together, which is what I love of working with women that are in leadership roles or that are sharing leadership that we get to lean into each other of like how do we do this in a new way and to do leadership in an unconditional way means that we're balanced in our willing that we have let go of I'm here to fix everyone I'm here to save the world I'm here to make sure that everybody around me is happy that's not gonna help and and it's it's actually conditional we're here to find how do we get to be sustainable in relationship to our inner fire? How do we nourish ourselves and then let that nourishment go out towards others? And that whether we're growing a business or we're learning how to lead ourselves better, that we're learning how to be in relationship with our own inner fire and feed it from love. And that that's really the foundation is we're learning how to shift from fear-based leadership and all the ways, which is comparison, judgment, trying to fix other people. That's all control-based hmm. into balance from love. I trust your path 
and let me shine what I've learned and embody what I've learned and let it go out into the world, trusting that that will kindle something inside of you and that I can share the wisdom from love so that we can all start to continue this journey of rearranging. And when we're in unconditional leadership, we're working with, we're on a journey with Mm. people rather than I'm done with my journey. Let me turn around now and tell you how to do it. I love that. I love that you use the words embodied. I believe in my heart and I teach that the new paradigm shift in leadership specifically for women is the embodiment. It's what we do. It's not what we do. It's it's who we be versus, right? It used to be what you do versus what you say, but now it's like who you be versus what you do. And as the mother of two daughters, I can tell you that that is how I have chosen to raise my children. And it is given back tenfold in ways I never even imagined. I am more quiet and I just lead by example. And it's it has been one of the best gifts to receive. And and I know that we're in this paradigm shift. It's it's why my colors are orange and blue, because I know we're in this shift of like the sacral chakra and really, you know, tra- like alchemizing that through our voice. Like I can just see it happening over the last 10 years, exponentially increasing. I'm so grateful that there are teachers like you that are out there teaching this. I love that you use the feeding the fire. I always think of it as like, I live in Florida, so we have natural springs. And I think of how resourceful and how abundant that spring is that just naturally keeps bubbling and giving to the life around it. And if we are fed from the inside out, it's actually such a relief to know that it it doesn't have to to be all these check boxes that we used to think but it's actually really just embodying the truth of who we are and that love and that trust that you talked about it's so much easier and giving women that permission to just know that it's actually just the 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 true embodiment of your gifts and who you are that it's such it feels so good. It just feels like that fresh of breath air, just like, oh, you mean I don't have to do anything except just show and be and speak my truth and just share that with people. And yes, that's actually all you have to do. And as I heard you speak in my mind, as I think of archetype work that I'm familiar with working with, I can see that the the in your book, the wild is the maiden, the willing is the mother, and the wise is the crone. And so when I hear you speak of keeping that balance in the leadership, if we think of ourselves, because we we all embody those different archetypes at different stages of our life and really daily. We have, mo- I hope everybody's still having moments of connecting with the goddess and the maiden, you know, every day. Um, it's important for us and the wild woman, um, I guess Kali is what I call her, but, you know, really just connecting with those parts of us because that is who we are fully and wholly embodied as women. And like you said, some of us connect with certain aspects of of the wholeness of who we are a little easier. For me, it was the warrior earlier on and really learning. And it's funny because as people began to know who I was as I was leading retreats, they very much saw me in my mother and my goddess, which I never, if they didn't know me for the first 25 years of my life, they would have, they would have, shown that. So it just goes to show that we all have that we can access those parts of us and really discover some truly amazing gifts. I want to talk about how do we keep, because we all have natural things that we're good at. We can, maybe they're sort of the way of being like you, you described, um, the overgiving, the over controlling or the the distraction as it relates to the different archetypes that we tap into. How do we know when we're truly embodying and living in that kind of that zone of, I guess in the corporate world, they call it the zone of genius, but kind of like that zone of ease is what I would say. When we're really in that gift, when we're really in alignment, And then on the other side, when we're out of balance, like how do you navigate 
when you're in alignment with your strength, with your, I call it strength, but with your flow, with your fire, with your alignment, and then when you're navigating the shadow of it or when you're out of alignment, what tools do you use to keep in those imbalance? Mm, that's such a great question. So I've been using throughout the book, Wild Willing Wise, I use the metaphor of the river and that the river is life and that there's times in our life where the water is calm and where we can rest and where we can look at the beauty and we can dream into possibilities or into change. And then there's times when there's big rapids and that it's messy. Like we fall out of the boat, we, we, but we, learn, we can learn skills. And so I think sometimes the hope is, well, the river will just be calm all the time and I'll never fall out of the boat and it won't be messy. But the truth is that we are going to be in places where we've never been and that we're challenged and we can learn skills to get through those rapids. We can learn skills of how to rest more and, and feed ourselves. When you think about somebody that is going down through a rapid for the first time, it's like messy and you're falling out and you don't know how to do it. But over time, if you gain skills, you're like, okay, I know how to read the river now. I have a sense of how the energy flows. And I know big paddle on the right, two paddles on the left, and there's skill. So the skills that I have worked with that have been incredibly helpful is understanding that everything is energy, that the agreements that I have that, that limit me, that I have taken on from the domestication, from my culture, from my parents, from schooling, that when I learn not to blame or shame or judge myself or others and just look at what's the energy, where am I leaking energy? Where have I tied energy to a story? And that it's an untangling. And that takes time that we get to be really patient with ourselves. And that another way to, to perceive it that's been incredibly helpful for me is that we want to be really clear about what our intent is. Where are we going? What's our focus? And that's the warrior. Like I have clarity. And even if that clarity is I want to surrender to life, that's a, a commitment, that's an intent. And that's lesson one of warrior goddess training of commit to you, be clear about what you want, set that energy. And that what we're doing is we're planting a seed in the universe and we're like, all right, universe, this is what I want. And that what starts to happen is guides and allies and books and teachers start to show up mm -hmm. and we start to gain skills and, and feel held and feel loved. and have synchronicities and that's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. But what I always share with people is like, that's only half or a part of the journey. The other part of the journey is there's gonna be obstacles that show up and fear and old agreement. And that when we learn how to face like, okay, now there's an obstacle. Instead of the universe is against me, I'm gonna use this obstacle against myself and beat myself up or compare or think there shouldn't be an obstacle. What I want us to really learn how to do is be like, hello, you are a worthy obstacle. Because those obstacles can help us to raise our energy to become more skillful. They're the, the reflection and the, the guidance, really. They're really some of our best allies to gain a way of using everything to get stronger and benefit ourselves. Because that's the choice we have. We can use everything against ourselves or we can use everything to get stronger, more courageous, more loving. And it takes time and it takes really starting to navigate ourselves from our heart rather mm -hmm. than our mind. I've been finding myself saying recently, like things just take time. They take as long as they need to take. And I think that's releasing the the sabotaging behavior of the illusion of control and just being willing to, you know, step into that, that flow and just accepting another beautiful, a couple of beautiful feminine energies that I've learned to, to embody or the art of receiving and also just releasing attachment. As I hear you speak, like really stepping into that trust is really that idea of, you know, releasing that attachment. Things take time. They take as long as they need to take and, you know, really just stepping into the the flow. But also what I'm hearing you say is knowing when it's when it's also time to meet that obstacle 
And what I love about the way that you shared it, what came to me is this idea, this thought that came to me is let sometimes you've been in the world of personal development, spiritual growth your whole life. And sometimes on that journey, it feels hard and it feels challenging. And it that again also is a choice, right? Suffering is a choice. And we can also choose to find the joy in it. I'm not saying that it's always fun, but I what I'm saying is, is that we get to choose how we respond to what we are met with. And when you said that, it kind of ignited that little idea in me and the thought of anybody who's listening who might be on the journey or the path thinking they're in that challenging place right now. And you know, they just maybe can't see the way out, but that there is choice in how you meet that obstacle. And I forget what the words you said were, but um, I think you said, how, how can I meet this obstacle? Or thank you for this, you know, new obstacle that I get to work with and over, o- overcome or work through and, and understand that it's a co-creation that I get to learn and, and grow from. And when we release that attachment that it says anything about us, whether we're doing it right or not, is really, I think where I know I have found personal joy in it, because as a former perfectionist and former overachiever, really understanding that I'm actually not in control, who would have thought? And, you know, letting go of the behaviors that you described, I was lived all of those really great at being over distracted and keeping myself busy, making myself feel super important, um, living in the illusion that I could control things, which the birth of my first daughter showed me absolutely not in control. Hallelujah. Like, thank you. I'm not in control. And you know, the, the people pleasing, I also had to learn in a really hard way. And so it's, it feels like such a, fr- a breath of fresh air to really, you know, just hear that from somebody who's been committed to this work or embodying it, living it your whole life, that yeah, we're all navigating this and we get to choose how to respond to it. And guess what? We can look at it differently. We can look at it like, well, how is this obstacle here for me? Not Why is this not happening to me? And, you know, change our outlook on on the experience itself. So thank you for that permission. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and the, the skill level, I think, is is that when we're not, when we can open into, we don't have to do this alone. I think this is some place oh. where women get into this, like, okay, if I'm doing it right, I'm like pushing through and I'm doing it by myself. And that shows me that I'm courageous and I'm a warrior goddess. And I'm like, no, we need each other. We need community. We need reflection. We need support. And so learning, like you said, how to receive. And then also, what skills do I need? If we're, when we're starting to witness ourselves, then we're, then we can be really honest with ourselves. Of like, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. I remember when this was about 20 years ago, but I was at a center in Berkeley and I was a young leader, I would say, with a community for the first time. And four years in, I started looking at the organization and I'm like, what is wrong? And I realized my old, like my old patterning had gone into the organization. And so I just, I really took responsibility for that of like, okay, I helped create this. What do I need to undo inside of myself? And it was that busyness and that force and that push energetic. And it took years to undo it. But I recognized I need to learn more skills. And part of that was I needed to learn how to communicate better. I'd never, I was like, oh, right. I never really learned how to communicate through conflict on a personal level. I was a brilliant teacher and my heart was definitely there. But in interpersonal stuff, that was much more difficult for me. And I, that was when I started telling myself, I'm like, you get to be in the first grade. You might have a PhD in this area of your life. And you also have, you're also in the first grade. And so go learn the skill of how to communicate, find that. And so there's this, this, this ease that starts to happen in our life, even when we have to do hard things, because we're like, oh, I just need another skill. And then we can go find that rather than making ourselves wrong, or I should already know this, or I can't let anybody know. We get to be vulnerable and tender and in process. 
and not make it personal either. You know, it doesn't say anything about us. I love that you brought that up. That was a personal experience of my own is learning how to communicate through conflict. And so, um, and asking for what we need, which I find so many women who wear that sort of badge of honor of like, oh, I can do it all and I make it happen. I call it a glamorous survivor strategy. It's, you know, it's <laughs> nice. led many, it's led many of us to outward success. We've become breadwinners. We've become mothers. We've become so many amazing things that maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we didn't think was possible. And now we're here. And now what? Well, now what is the time where we get to shift and really teach the next generation of how to really come home to still being that feminine leader, but not, not refined in a masculine world. Like the world is waiting and ready for us to really show that we get to do this our way. We're not doing it in the way that we were told that we thought we had to in order to succeed. And the world is a hundred percent ready for it. It's been shifting for years and I believe it starts in your home. It starts in your community. And then you just continue to create platforms to expand that like we're doing here. I'm curious, do you see a col in the work that you do? I'm sure you meet so many people. Do you see a collective theme, like overall theme that we're moving from and into like a pattern or behavior do you do you see something that kind of overrides everything or do you just see facets of all of the behaviors in in different ways I do feel like like you shared Jen that there is a big paradigm shift that we're in the midst of right now and that it is shifting from more conditional judge reward oriented ways of being in the world to more unconditional bringing in love like understanding consequences being able to witness ourselves and I work with a lot of women that are like I know this isn't working I'm sure you're the same way like I've gotten this level of a success or I raised my family or I put all my work behind my partner and now I don't know who I am now I'm not sure what to do next like I'm not fulfilled and so I think that's part of a larger paradigm of all of us looking around and being like, this isn't exactly working. Can we do this in a different way? And that, like you said, it starts on the inside and, and then radiates out. And it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, one of the things I've been playing with with the wild, willing, wise archetype is that how do we know if we're really living them? That when we get squeezed, like when a, a challenge happens or when, we get stuck or scared, what comes out of us? And when we're balanced with our wild, what comes out of us is curiosity. We're like, huh, wonder, okay, let's look at this. Like, let's look at it in different ways. And there's this, there's a little bit of excitement of like, ooh, okay, what's this? Something shifted. There's something to learn here. When we're really connected to our willing and balanced in that willing energy, when we get squeezed, what comes out is courage this place of like, all right, this might be hard. And I don't know how to do this, but I trust myself. There's this level of faith and that I'm in for the long haul. I'm gonna, not going to abandon myself because that's something I see so many of us have done and that we're shifting is that there's been a level of abandonment of the body and the emotional body and our energy that's been so high that many of us have been living way out here and we're now coming, finding our way back home to ourselves again. And that, that takes courage. And that that's what, when we're balanced with our willing, that courage comes up naturally. We don't have to think about it. We're just like, all right, I'm in, let's do this. It's gonna take whatever long it takes. And then when we're connected to our whys, that what arises is compassion. This just deep compassion for ourselves, for the human experience. And also this long, long, long picture view of the, the web and the tangle that's getting unwoven now in humanity that we may see in our lifetime and we may not, but we mm. know that we will show up with ourselves and with others from that place of unconditional love. And that there's, again, that understanding of consequences, boundaries, and, and just the beauty of being alive. Mm. Yeah. I feel like the the hand that holds all those together, the wise, the 
the willing and the wild or the curiosity, the courage and the compassion is, um, well, I guess what you're calling unconditional love is like, it's also a uh, gross trust. I feel like it, when I'm hearing you say that it takes a deep level of trust in ourselves and just in the process in, of life to allow ourselves to receive those deeper layers of and and open to receiving that curiosity and that courage and that compassion in order to um because it's, it's a process of like the internal alchemy happening so that we can also be in the world that we are living in right it's like here's our world and then how do we be in the world with others as we go forward to you know connect with others and to just be in our element that creates the change that the world needs or you know with other whether that be in your own home or in your community or on a global scale um i feel like trust is one of those one of the courses that i teach is called prosperity and it's really just this idea of giving from a place of being resourced and prosperity the energy of it the frequency of it is embodied trust because from that place of trust we're willing to open to receive so that we can be resourced and then continue to to give back but not giving as an action more giving as a, a way of being because we are resourced into who we naturally really are and so um i love that you turn the words into a way that we can understand easily that that energy of the courage, the curiosity, and the compassion, because those are easily relatable to to the daily life. So um, that's super fun. So one one of the things that I see is, you know, one of the things that you talk about is finding balance in an unbalanced world, and um, it's this theme that I'm noticing, and I think COVID really helped us to slow down a little bit. I feel like distraction and busyness, as I talked a little bit earlier, coming from that over-dominant warrior energy, sort of that badge of honor of where many women are and they're finding that they're unfulfilled, that we've, we've, that word hustle, I really, you know, I, I choose alignment over hustle. How do we break down this energy of, of this idea? How do we, how do we really tap into the vulnerability to believe or trust that the balance of like the wise woman or the goddess and letting go of that warrior mentality that has kept us safe for so long that has brought us potentially financial success or, you know, I find that there's a breakdown somewhere, but that has brought us um, maybe success in our work or whatever it is. How do we find that? I guess, what are some tools or what are what are ways that you've been able to lean into that trust to get to where you are really in that space of life to live within more wisdom versus more kind of survival kind of, you know, mentality? Yeah, because I see that in the world. I see the busyness. I see the distraction. I mean, I believe that we're the source of our time and money and energy, and but I've, it's taken a lot for me to get there. And I, I'm I'm practicing daily that that belief, but I hear all the time people say they don't have time for the things that they need. I feel like that's like the biggest excuse, and I'm not saying it, but it's just I hear mm -hmm. it all the time. How do we get people to shift and realize that they get to choose? their experience, they get to choose to say no to the things that aren't aligned with them, that are creating that busyness, that overwhelm and that distraction, pulling them further out of that trust, further out from that wise woman. I feel like that's the shift that a lot of women are looking for. What have been some things that have been really helpful? I mean, you're on a book tour right now. You've written nine books. You have, you've done a lot of things in your life. So how do you manage the time and the energy to only do the things that are totally in alignment and keeping those healthy boundaries? What is this? What's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> Still in process. <laughs> And I'd say part of the shift was like what I was saying when I had the center in Berkeley and I realized like 
I have created a whole paradigm that's based on an old way of being in relationship to work. And one of the things I did was I took a, a year off. I went on another book tour at that time with my first book, but I, and I started looking at, okay, what have, what have I done and what have we done as humans? And I realized we had it upside down that we've been trained. If you do, then you'll be successful. Then you'll be happy. Then you'll be a good human. And that it was all about the doing. And so I crafted something that I call our true work. And I got really curious about, okay, so what's, what's actually the core? Like, again, going down to what's the root. And so one of the tools that I gave myself and that I share is this idea that what if instead of there's my purpose, there's what I'm here to do in the world that is externally based, that there's one word and one quality that we're here to learn how to embody. And it's not the quality we know how to do. It's something that is coming from our, the depths of our being. And so for me, that was love. When I really looked at it, I'm like, I'm just here to love. And how do you know if something's your true work? You can do it when you're in front of 100 people sharing. You can do it when you are cleaning your toilet. And you can do it when you are picking up dog shit in the backyard. Like there, and there's no difference. Like we've also done like, this is an important job and this is not an important job. And that's part of where we've created our suffering, I think. Because then we're identifying with I am a writer or I am a businesswoman or I am a mother. And it's the identification with the roles and then doing the roles right. And then the judgment and the comparison that all starts to. And so to just like be like, okay, let's turn everything upside down and go to what's the one quality I want to be bringing through everything I do. And that picking up dog shit in the backyard is just as important as writing the book or whatever. And that's how I live my life now. Like, I don't see a separation. I'm going to go do a book talk probably with 100 people tonight. And dumping the sewer in my trailer today, earlier, the same, I'm bringing the same love to it. And it, it takes practice. That means everything becomes practice. Hmm. Everything. So when I'm out of love, when I'm judging or when I'm fearful or when I'm closed, then I'm like, oh, sweetheart, what do you need? And there's this new way that we get to learn how to be in relationship to ourselves that is gentle and fierce. That is, hi, sweetie, I'm here. All right, there's going to be a hard thing we're going to do. Let's do it. And, and that also, that, okay, we can be in, in more ease. And so that has helped me tremendously. And I'd say the second tool that I would offer today is my, what I call one of my favorite teachings. I just call the period teaching that many of us live in run on sentences. And the run on sentence is I made this mistake and that proves that I'm not worthy. Like my mother told me that I wasn't worthy. And then I'm remembering the situation that happened when I was a kid. And so we have this mind that is just this huge run on sentence usually that's based in victimization or judgment. And if we sit back and start to watch our mind, it's kind of horrifying how yeah. much their content there is. And so I'm like, oh, it's just a grammar problem. Hmm. I and love the grammar how you problem simplify is, it. It's everything. Yeah. yeah, I always try to bring it like, let's get down to the core. And then we just get to learn how to put periods in our little minds and be like, hey, mind, oh, that's not a run on sentence, period. Take a breath, reassess. Like I, I'm like, period open what's my intent my intense love how do I bring love here hmm. and for me that love isn't like everything's fine it's like love is about responsible action and presence and so there's a that period take a breath reassess and that we're doing we're going to be putting periods in our minds over and over and over and over and over again but that we have the courage to keep doing that and eventually the mind starts to get quieter. It starts to trust our heart. It starts to trust the intent. And we start to live from that true work as just a natural with everything that we're doing. And the mind starts to rest more and more into the heart. They start so to align and yes, simplify. Exactly. And that, to exactly. me, that's where the embodiment comes in. As you mentioned earlier, we've been living out here and it's really just aligning that heart and mind and soul in the body and it's 
it's easier. There's more flow. It's simple. And to put into words, I guess the way I would reframe it is I often find, and myself, I have done this and I work with women on this as well, how often we try to uh, over explain ourselves or um, just, it's like, we feel like we have to explain why we believe something or do something like we don't have to just practicing clarity and trust and just speaking simply and clearly, but that it sounds easy, but it actually takes a very deep level of vulnerability and trust to get there and to learn that communication skill of checking in with yourself first to get the clear words and checking in emotionally to have the courage to say the thing without explaining ourselves and keeping it simple. That yeah. is another tool that takes a lot of practice. <laughs> exactly. So simple. And I love it. Yeah. That there's a shift that we're in right now of away from judgment towards discernment. We need discernment yes. and also away from victim, victim. And what about me? And I'm not enough to vulner, like true vulnerability, mm. which is authenticity. It's strength. And it's that and from a place of love. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Of like, yeah, being with, with ourselves. And, and I think the third thing that just popped into my head is that one of the things I learned through the pandemic, because I was in the, in the middle of the pandemic, I started writing a really big memoir about like the most difficult time in my life. And I recognized, I'm like, okay, this isn't really what the world needs right now. We don't need more, like, I'll write that one later. Right now, I feel like because our attention was so fractured and it was so difficult, it's like, we need to take ourselves less personally. We need to have more of a sense of humor and to kind of have fun with ourselves and have easy things to grasp onto. And so Wild Willing and Wise has been really profound for people. I know it's, it's helped me tremendously to just look at like, oh, I'm out of balance with my wild. Like many of us have lost our connection to our sense of play and joy and we become more brittle and more held back and trying to make ourselves smaller and fit in and and to just recognize, oh, it's just a tweak. I'm not broken. I don't have to fix that, something. I just need a list of like, how could I reconnect with my wild? And so there's ways that we can do visualizations and reconnect with that guide of our wild that's already inside of us. And same with the willing and the wise. And that we can also then look outside and be like, all right, what does wild look like that feels good to me? Mm -hmm. So that might be, spending more time in nature, playing with animals, hanging around kids that are wild and taking like being like, oh yeah, that's how I play. That's how I do it. So we can do the inner work of freeing that wild. And we can also surround ourselves with that energetic so that we soak it in and can make the shift that way. Mm, There's a I lot of that. cussing in the new book. It's like, it's <laughs> such a fun book. It's so different than anything I've written. And it's a workbook because that's the other thing. I'm yes. Like, I just want to give people super simple tools. Here's a book, like self-inquiry, take this little quiz, find out more about yourself. Here's a list of how to balance your wild, either excess or deficiency. And it's, I hope you enjoy it because I think you're going to find you're going to be laughing out loud on the plane. Oh, it's good. really funny. Yeah. I poke I, a lot of fun at myself and I've had a lot of hilarious experiences. <laughs> yeah. I love that you're in that place in life where you just get to laugh at yourself. And again, like, I, I just love that, you know, in my experience of being in personal development, I mean, really my whole life, but at many different levels, just really remembering back when I felt like, gosh, is this what my life is going to be like? Like, this seems so hard. Like, what am I doing? I'm rewiring my, you know, generational trauma and all this, like, this isn't fun. Why well, didn't sign up for this? And then exhausting. Like, yeah. and now just being at the point where it's like, if that doesn't define me, that doesn't make me a hero. That doesn't make me, you know, all these other things. It was just what I had to go through to get to where I'm at. And what a relief that I'm not attached to any of that and don't need to be recognized by anybody to even do that. But to also honor and recognize that it was necessary to be where I am now and be, have gratitude for that shift. But like you said, just taking things less personally. And you're right. Like I, I talked to my kids about this all the time, like, gosh, why do adults become so serious? Like, why, why? And it's, sometimes it's necessary and sometimes it's not, you know, and just really knowing, like navigating that we get to be all those things at any given time and we get to choose. 
and that hopefully we're giving permission to the people listening to really just allow more of that flow and that freedom. And also, I love that you said discernment. It's something that I've been working on for about four or five years, you know, really where that it's so interesting, that shell of the warrior, right? Well, underneath all that for me was really a people pleaser because I was in the military, like I did everything I was told. And then finding, find, walking my way into a friendship that ended in betrayal and really understanding at the deepest core wound of the divine feminine, of course it came through the feminine, was that underneath all this toughness that I thought I was, was a, a, a people pleaser and really around the feminine. And so really learning and understanding that judgment versus discernment was probably one of the hardest. I'm still in practice of it. Um, And I feel like it's, you know, one that I'll be practicing for a very long time because it wasn't one that was easy for me to, to really recognize that I was in. I love that you've brought up a lot of the behaviors that many of us are met with daily, weekly, monthly, in how we get relationships that reflect back to us ways that we might overgive or we're not discerning enough in a healthy way because we're afraid of being too judgmental or we think we can control things, who our kids are, who our spouse is, how our clients are going to get results, all the things that we think we're controlling or how when things get really tough, we isolate and we hide or we keep ourselves busy and over distracted. So I feel like we, especially, I know in my experience, the more that I step out into the world, the more I'm met with these things. And so it's, it's where we get to practice at a new level, which is why having a community, and I know you have a community of, you have a tribe of women. You've been doing this for a really long time. You also do retreats. You have a book writing retreat coming up. It's why community and tribe is so important. I want to end our conversation with, with on that note, because I feel like it's an ancient tradition that has been forgotten. I think about, you know, how we used to live in community and tribe and multiple mothers would take care of your children. And one mother would have the wisdom of herbal medicine and one would be the cook and one would, you know, we, we all had different things that we were good at. And we've forgotten that because we think we can do it all. So I want to talk a little bit about community and the value of that and how you create a tribe and a community of women to come together, how you support them, what that looks like and where people can find out more. Thank you. Yes. The circle is so important and that, that understanding we can't do it all. It's an illusion. Like, just going to the grocery store, if you think about how many hands have brought that apple for us to pick up from the grocery store, like we're all so deeply interwoven. And what I found with community is that it's such a powerful place to create a safe container for us to be courageous, for us to make mistakes and try new things and learn and be met with support. And so what I always say to people is you wanna find a community where the folks in the community are like, hi, who are you today? Like, let's grow together. Not a community that's, here's how you fit in. Here's what who we need you to be in order to belong. So when we find communities and we heal from the places of conditional community, because there's a lot of conditional mm-hmm. community, when we start to find unconditional community, it's such a joy. And we also know that there's a honeymoon period where everybody loves each other. And then in a, in a real community, and when I, when I first wor- wrote Warrior Goddess Training, I said to Randy, my publisher, I was like, I don't wanna just write a book. I wanna create a movement. I wanna create a revolution that women are coming together and, and teaching each other and supporting each other. And he's like, let's do it. And we did. Mm-hmm. And we have you know, the, the community that space that myself and the Warrior Goddess mentors hold We all know that there's a lot of love and support there. And we also know that there's going to be conflict and that's healthy in a community and that we're going to learn, you know, as you're in community, what starts to happen is you feel safe and then your stuff starts showing up. Mm -hmm. And to be able to bring that into the community and be like, I feel like I'm being abandoned or I'm scared or I don't, you know, I don't feel like I can trust you. 
And I just had this with a really dear, dear one in my life who she's like, I just don't think I can trust you. And I'm like, that's fair. But why? Let's talk that through. And there wasn't the defense of like, you have to trust me. I was like, yeah, let's, let's work through your fear. And I know I'm trustworthy in this relationship. I may not be trustworthy in other places hmm. in terms of like me in relation, like intimate relationships, not exactly trustworthy in who I pick. But I also know to go to my girlfriends and be like, what do you think of this one? And I can trust them, <laughs> even if I can't completely trust myself, which is good. Like we need mm -hmm. each other in that way. And then it becomes, we're courageously creating space to scenic, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. shed what's not ours and to reflect with love where we are, where we have the sharp edges. And I think that's where community can be so beautiful as we, we can learn skills together. We can also rub up against each other and start to shed the sharp, fearful edges and get more and more loving. So I just had this vision of, it, it really is. I'm, as you're speaking, I'm feeling it because I've experienced it so many times to know that love and that growth that happens. I think of like a single flower is beautiful and a field and a garden of wildflowers is breathtaking right like it that was the feeling that I got as as you said that and mm -hmm. the, one of the beautiful things that I've experienced and witnessed in everything that you're saying and and I feel like what I've taken away from what I got out of your first book warrior goddess and the permission that it really gave me to continue creating space for other women is that in that space of vulnerability is really where the beauty and the potential is. It's really where we sort of unleash in the messiness and the beauty, the, the true self and what greater gift can we really give ourselves and the people in our lives to witness that. I don't know to me that there is a greater gift personally. Um, not that we have to label it but in what i've experienced like it's such a beautiful gift to really witness the rawness of human potential like that soul essence of, of who people are so thank you for your work thank you so much for your time today as you're on a book tour thank you for the embodiment of your wisdom your teachings thank you for being willing to share through your books through your book tour, through your podcast. I'm super grateful. I'm honored to share your work with other people. It's shifted me in my beliefs and who I am in my life, who I get to be as a mother, who I get to be as a business owner, who I get to just be as a human. So I'm super grateful for your time and your your wisdom and your, your willingness to be on my podcast to share. So I just want to say thank you and give you the opportunity to just share where can people find out more about what you're doing. I don't see a uh, Florida town on your book tour yet, um, but just can you just share with us more about where we can find out your work, how they can be a part of your circle, and also, again, just share the name of your newest book. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Jen. My heart is so full and it's you know, so <laughs> you're receiving <laughs> i am receiving <laughs> so yummy so uh warriorgoddess.com is the website and the book has its own little website wildwillingwise.com and that shows where i i'm on book tour i'll go on book tour again next year we're having so much fun we've been on a two-month 25 city book tour and so next next round will be florida and tennessee i hope we can get you in a bunch of other places. And also I social media, Warrior Goddess, uh, and all my social media is Heather Ash Amara on Facebook and Instagram. So. Awesome. And then your circle, your tribe of women, can you share just a little bit about that? You have Warrior Goddess mentors just for someone who's new. Yeah. So I train leaders. I do unconditional leadership and, and I train women how to be warrior guys, facilitators and mentors. And that that group and myself, we have an online community. And I do a lot of retreats and travel around a lot, but we also have a really beautiful online community 
of women that meet regularly and do learnings and classes that's held by not just me, which I really love. Mm -hmm. People get to see how the warrior goddess teachings have impacted others and the different lenses we all hold and the different colors that we share in our life, the light that we shine. And so that's, uh, there's a couple ways entry points into that. There's a program called Seasons of Self that is a three month and then the leadership program which I do once a year and then another journey the nine moons that's for personal development so those are the three main online offerings and all of that is on warriorgoddess.com amazing thank you so much for sharing Heather Ash thank you for your time enjoy your book tour tonight in Phoenix and that's actually where my rebirth was that was where my daughter was born <laughs> Oh my gosh! I love yeah. it. Well, I will send you some some good Phoenix. I know. From there. How, <laughs> I love the synchronicities, and then even deeper than that, of my forty seven years, I've lived in thirteen states. I was born in Tucson. My daughter was born in Phoenix, but I've only lived in Arizona for two and a half years of my forty seven years. It's just, she was a mother wow. in my former life. It's it's all like it's it's pretty wild how that how everything just came together for that. But so. Phoenix and Arizona there. And I know you did Sedona. I think you did it or you're about to do it. It's just such a special grounding, wonderful place. Although I live at the ocean now, like it's just always has a special place in my heart. So super fun that we got to talk while you're there. I'm kind of feeling the the energy when you're there. So thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful day. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. Aloha. Aloha.